thank you for attending this webinar. Um, it's um, it's a pleasure to be co-hosting this webinar with with Dr. Mary Kay O'Neill. Um, so, um, as a way of uh, providing a bit more color to our backgrounds, I am a neurologist by background with a PhD in digital medicine, and I'm part of the founding team at Sworn Health, a digital MSK care provider, and. I coordinate um, all things related to clinical research uh, and clinical outcomes and also clinical development, and it's a pleasure to be uh, with you today. Um, Dr. Mary Kay, uh, the stage is yours. Uh, please uh, provide a, br a brief intro, and then you can uh, take us off. Sure. And um, my clinical background is in physical medicine rehabilitation, so I have done a lot of work in the world of musculoskeletal healthcare throughout my career, and I'm the subject matter expert for that area for Mercer. Um, I have also, uh, in the last seven years I've been with Mercer, worked with a number of different clients of ours, large and small, all kinds of industries, and uh, musculoskeletal issues are often one of the leading issues for any, any given company. So it is important to think carefully about engaging vendor partners in this area um, and making sure not only that the clinical background of the product is excellent, but that they are designed to really work well with you, the employer. And so that, this is the basis of our conversation, and I will go through some of the uh, structure of how I look at things with, in on behalf of our clients um, to try to decide who is the best partner for them going forward to, to bring a musculoskeletal solution that really helps people. So on, on to the next. My practice within Mercer is called Total Health Management, and what we try to do is kind of like what I just described a minute ago, which is to make sure that anything that is uh, purchased or engaged or provided on behalf of your uh, members and employees is very sound from a clinical perspective, but also that it is designed to work for your population in, in ways that are, it, are accessible, understandable, and effective. And so it's really a healthcare strategy approach uh, for your specific populations when we, when we work with our clients. And so those are the kinds of uh, viewpoints and priorities that we'll go through here for a few moments, and then Fernando will um, talk about the way that SWORD has designed their product to meet these. Uh, so one of the, I think, overarching goals for everybody I work with um, in the HR field is to figure out what needs to be in place to make sure that employees are, are thriving. And I think we've all been through quite a bit of a a challenge over the last couple of years <laughs> in that regard. Uh, everything has sort of changed and it's been very stressful for a lot of people. Um, so I think this is more important than ever. But what we know is if people are engaged with work, are able to do the work in a safe and healthy way, that the overall health burden in the population diminishes. And this, of course, diminishes costs. Um, I, I think there's a lot of great evidence out there that if people are engaged in with an employer who has demonstrated that they understand what people are dealing with and uh, resources are available for things that matter to the employee, there's a lot higher degree of loyalty in the workforce and turnover is less, which I think everybody is very sensitive to right now. It's been a, a really tough time in that regard. Um, and if as uh, employees are healthy and engaged, there's safety uh, level goes up and people are more productive and uh, less time away from work, uh, more uh, enthusiastic about what they do, I think, you know, good work is, a, is part of health. And so that, that's another place where getting these things right really pays off. And then we actually have three different studies that were done all before the pandemic, but, you know, three different large scale studies that looked at measuring uh, what kind of health um, uh, status people have and then how, what the actual business performance is, and those all went up as well. So, so this is how we go after this. What is the integrated approach? Of course, I think uh, I'm going to start over on the right-hand side. 
we look at the clinical focus and make sure is this product really substantial and really of quality uh, from a clinical impact and safety perspective. That's what we need to have out of the gate. But then the other things that are so important are employee engagement. Is this product uh, designed to, to meet the needs of people? Is it described in a way that people understand it? Is it placed in the sort of ecosystem that you all have put together in your companies um, so that people can use it in a practical way in the context of their work and their life? Um, do, does it work with your philosophy in the supportive work environment? Is it something that other people within your organization or other vendors can refer to and get people engaged with? Is there data behind it, and can you continuously monitor how well this is working in your population? So I think that's a really important component of, of partnership with vendors is how, what's their data and reporting and oversight capabilities, and how do they share that with you? And do you, find, do you have a partner who themselves are engaged with continuous improvement of their product? So those are, those are some of the beginning criteria that I utilize. So I think that probably everybody on this call knows this well, but health and well-being is a, a basic part of the workforce strategy. It means a great deal in terms of, as I mentioned earlier, the individual employee's relationship with the company, their willingness to, to stay with it, their willingness to participate in work and, and be a productive member of the, of the workforce. Um, it also has a lot to do with how people feel in terms of trust in terms of their employer. So I, um, it, it is a great investment. I think you, you probably all know, but there's a lot of different areas where I think the investment shows up. Sometimes in HR we look at claims cost, and that's, of course, very important, but it's not the only variable that, that this kind of approach um, affects. So, and I think my bot the bottom line here <laughs> is that we need to look at things in a quite holistic way, and we need to look at, at it from the perspective of the individuals that we're trying to help. What is our impact on them, and how, how does that play out in all these different um, uh, fields of, of importance, health, healthcare expenditures, productivity, and turnover and satisfaction with, with their work. So, uh, this is a, from a, a study from uh, the Business Group on Health about what employers are identifying as their health conditions of concern. Cancer obviously is a big one. It's an extremely expensive thing uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. We've, we've had huge clinical breakthroughs, but at a cost, of course. Uh, MSK is second, but I would say if you looked at the size of the population that MSK affects, that's a much larger number of, of the workforce than cancer, thank goodness. Uh, but it is a really important uh, topic, and it does generate a lot of claims costs, but it, but it also affects a huge number of people. And I would say one of the things about MSK is that it affects people throughout the whole age range. So this is something younger people have as well as older people. And some of these other diseases, as I think you probably know, uh, have a tendency to affect people you know, later in their career. So. On to the next. So having said all that, what do we do to when we look at a digital solution? Um, and so I, I put this out for uh, Fernando and for uh, Sword as, as a uh, format for approaching how, how to evaluate a vendor partner. Um, so starting up, uh, upper left, there is clinical quality. Uh, like I said, that is absolutely necessary. If you don't have that, then the rest of it doesn't really matter because you're not really providing services for folks. If you choose... Uh, to go with a company that is in a partnership, how, have, how thoughtful have they been about their implementation and support through the uh, entire engagement? I think sometimes people don't understand how hard HR professionals are working right now and just uh, how stretched they are with everything that they've gone through and trying to manage our current situation. 
but is the, is the product designed and is the team at the vendor uh, designed to really support you so this is not such a, a huge burden to implement even a, a really great program? And have they been thoughtful about member engagement? How do they talk about themselves? How do they put information out there so people can understand, yes, this is something I can do, this, this will work for me, the language that's used makes sense. Uh, even thoughtfulness about how through your organization these messages might be um, placed. So particularly with musculoskeletal, if you have a lot of on-site employees, we really um, recommend that you talk with your safety organization to make sure that they would know something like this is available. So if they can find somebody who has a need, they can make that connection. Uh, up on the right-hand side, do you, is there real-world outcomes? And for us, the real world is, you know, this has a number of companies engaged in this process and seen real measurable results. And so can, they, can a vendor show you this? Can they show you that when, when engaged, that um, that they've made a difference in how things are going for another company that's similar to yours. And are they holistic? It, one of the things I think many people suffer from, what I call it in the vendor sphere, is vendor overload. And they don't always think, you know, as they're developing their product, that they may need to either address other issues that they encounter as they interact with your members, or can they refer people who are outside the scope of what they do to high quality, meaningful re uh, resources that you already have lined up for them? So really taking the whole person approach. And so you know, I think one of the big things that everybody knows is on everyone's plate right now is behavioral health. And it affects musculoskeletal care as, um, just like everything else because if people are not feeling uh, good from a behavioral health perspective, it's very hard to engage in fitness activities and improvement. Um, so can those issues be identified? Can they be addressed? And if necessary, can people be redirected if the scope of the problem is, is too great? Can you measure the impact? On, there's a bunch of different metrics I, I pointed to, but there needs to be solid measurement. It, can you see what the impact of this engagement would be over time? And does this product uh, or service work for everybody in your workforce? Uh, I think the other thing that we have learned very intensely over the last couple of years is if you take a very generic approach to a large population, you probably aren't helping everybody equally. So can people find uh, pr uh, providers or coaches or, or therapists that they can relate to and, and establish trust? It, you know, are, are these solutions designed for people that have very busy lives and not a huge amount of discretionary time. So all of those kinds of things and are, are the communications um, done in a very thoughtful and respectful way um, in terms of all the different parts of your community. So now I'm going to turn it over to Fernando to so all these questions I asked him to, <laughs> to answer it from the perspective of SWORD. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mary Kay, um, for the um, for the introduction and for this explanation on how uh, you view uh, these kinds of solutions and what, in your perspective, is is important to to make sure that we get right on the solution side. And I'm now going to um, show you how uh, we can at sort of address each and one of these points, um, um, and we'll go we'll go point by point. So, um, again, taken from the a Business Group on Health survey, uh, employers are very concerned about quality of care. And quality of care and ensuring quality of care means that whatever solution you choose, you need to make sure that the bases are there and that the solution is rooted in, in evidence-based care. And so how do we uh, approach this uh, from a sort of perspective and how can you look at it? So when you look at the evidence behind a given solution, does and if you grade the degree of evidence, there is meta-analysis, systematic reviews, then randomized control trials, then cohort groups. There's all sorts of um, different uh, types of clinical publications and clinical trials. 
but really what you should be looking for in a solution is a randomized control trial because that means that whatever digital solution that you're looking into, it was compared against something else. Um, and, and, and allocation to those groups was done randomly. Uh, but um, the story doesn't end there. Um, if you are comparing your solution against something, you need to look at the something which you're comparing against. And it can be do nothing, it can be what people usually have, and it can be a um, well-designed high-intensity intervention, for example, which we usually call the gold standard. Um, but behind and beyond um, um, the, um, the story of um, looking for randomized control trials, you should also look at uh, real-world evidence. So outside the world of um, a trial who was prepared and thought um, to address and answer a specific question. If you open that to the world, what happens with the solution? Does it have solid real world evidence? And especially looking at studies spanning different conditions and cohorts of people uh, in different conditions, different age groups, different um, clinical scenarios, because um, that is what your population looks like. And um, I mean, at SWORD, we have a deep commitment to clinical integrity, um, and we tackle this through both uh, rigorous control trials, where we directly compare our digital programs against high intensity in-person physical therapy, not against a waiting list, not against uh, what people usually have on the day-to-day -day world, but what people should have if we all lived in an ideal world. Um, that's the high bar that we set ourselves against. And we pair that um, with data coming from real-world evidence. You'll see later in this webinar how uh, we collect information that we get in a systematic way to then allow us to report back and to give data back to you um, so that you can uh, see what type of impact we are having on, on your population. And um, I mean, this all translates into um, this huge commitment that SOAR has with clinical quality translates into more randomized control trials than any other company in this space. And especially um, our randomized control trials are done against high intensity in-person PT. And so you should really um, dive deep into what the control group looks like when you're assessing a solution. We also have more real-world evidence published than other digital uh, health uh, MSK solutions in both acute and chronic care. And in fact, if you take all our clinical validation together, we uh, currently have more peer-reviewed uh, papers than all our uh, most close competitors combined. And uh, it's not stopping here because we really want to commit to presenting very high-level evidence supporting both, um, both uh, supporting all, all our service lines and all our solutions. Um, if we just take a, a deeper dive on, on our randomized control trials against high intensity in-person PT, you'll see that we can maximize uh, clinical outcomes, uh, both on the short and uh, mid and long term uh, after a surgery in these uh, three cases, which are the examples that we brought. So, um, Total hip replacement, total knee replacement, and shoulder tendon repair surgery. These were our first three control trials. We currently have two additional uh, clinical trials almost finished, and uh, we're totaling five. And if you look at the charts here, you'll see that we can achieve better and quicker results, both uh, at the short and midterm after a knee and hip replacement, and then sustain clinical outcomes and sustain improvement after shoulder tendon repair surgery. And this is through a combination of uh, being able to pack a lot more intensity early on, uh, which justifies how we can maximize outcomes in the short and midterm. And then the second point is the empowerment. So by providing a solution that allows people to do the, their sessions at home, whenever and wherever they can, um, it allows them to um, pack a lot more intensity on the one side and then recognize that they own their uh, recovery process and therefore they become more empowered, they become more active, and that helps sustain clinical outcomes. This covers the clinical validation um, uh, part. Then, 
how uh, good of a partner are we um, when we are selected and when we are working with with the clients? So first of all, um, it's not uh, and um, as um, as Dr. Mary Kay was saying, um, HR leaders have uh, a lot of things on their plate and um, they shouldn't be worried about um, uh, how a solution rolls out. We actually need to take the heavy lifting. We need to do the heavy lifting. We need to and do um, go first into discovery stage where we co-build a launch plan uh, together together with uh, with our clients. And um, and of course, we, we know what the best practices are. We know what success looks like and we know what we need to do to get there. Um, but we just uh, take uh, take this. Um, we discuss this with, uh, with 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 the client, and we then adapt the plan to the specific situation. We deploy, we test, and we currently optimize. And we report on performance on a regular basis. Um, not only obviously in terms of engagement numbers and clinical outcomes, but also which channels are driving the biggest um, enrollments. And and then we use those learnings to to perfect um, and execute post launch plans. So essentially, we do the heavy lifting, and um, and because we know that um, having an effective marketing uh, is equal to uh, successful outcomes. Uh, again, uh, as I told you, um, we know what um, what success looks like and what we need to do to get there. Um, and this slide illustrates that depending on uh, what type of access we have to a population, obviously the engagement on a population level um, varies anywhere between three and nine percent. And uh, in in this respect, so musculoskeletal conditions affect roughly forty to fifty percent of the population, and about um, almost half of them are actively seeking care. So there's a, a huge potential. Uh, to uh, to target a lot of the population, and the greater access that we have, obviously more volume of people are going to be driven towards our solution. And uh, I mean, we're biased, but the truth is, if this solution was chosen because it is cost effective, and especially if there are performance guarantees in place, then there is no reason not to drive more volume to that solution because the alternative is if people are seeking care and don't know about the solution they're going to continue seeking care where they usually seek care and that's not the best approach that's not cost effective and that is part of the problem in order for us to be part of the solution we need to actually work with our clients to make sure that we disseminate knowledge about sort throughout the population and um, again the good part is all of this is covered by performance guarantee. So um, the more marketing access that we have, the more people we can engage. Um, and then how good of a partner are we and how quickly you can launch? Because we take, we do the heavy lifting and we know our stuff. Uh, you can launch as quickly as uh, two weeks. And um, um, we have an average client satisfaction rating in terms of implementation and and, and, and in their relationship with customer success managers of 9.9 .9 out of 10 on our customer services uh, survey. And um, we have 100% retention rate in our clients. We have never uh, lost a client. Um, and um, we work every day very hard to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, so we talked a bit about member engagement and how uh, much engagement you can expect on a population level, um, anywhere between three and nine, depending on the market access that we have. But what happens when people know about the solution and want to engage in that solution? How do we measure that? What are the benchmarks? And then are there uh, price and performance guarantees tied to engagement? Um, I usually say that um, the best pill is the pill that people take. Um, so people do need to take their exercise pill in order for us to have good clinical outcomes. So engagement is a leading indicator of how well a given solution is going to perform. And um, in our case, um, we have, uh, obviously people only engage with something they like um, and, and the solution they like. So um, our 9.7 out of 10 member satisfaction really speaks to how engaging our solution is and our services. And uh, again, we work very hard to make sure that we have 
the best product, a very solid product that people can engage with and, and, and pair that with, with a very solid service uh, line uh, where everyone um, is paired with, with, a, uh, with a physical therapist that manages and launches that, their whole program. Um, we don't deliver uh, high quality MSK care by uh, delivering by pairing people with, uh, with health coaches. High quality clinical care needs to be delivered by clinicians. And um, on average, our members um, engage in um, 31 sessions in total, and about 83% of all members that start the program complete the program. This compares very favorably with, uh, with in-person PT, where completion rates can be uh, between 30 to 50% max, and it compares, again, very favorably with, with our closest um, competitors, and in this respect, SWORD has um, uh, the leading completion rates in in this market. Um, we also have, um, and before going into real world evidence, sorry, uh, going back to, to this point, we also pioneered the price structure uh, that um, was based on investment milestones. Um, and um, because we feel obviously that, um, again, engagement is leading in a case of clinical outcomes. And therefore, we approach uh, we approach the market with uh, with a milestone based approach based on engagement. Um, and uh, again, that was something that is now becoming the norm in this space, but it wasn't uh, until we pioneered it. Uh, now, on to the importance of uh, real world evidence. Um, in, and back to the uh, business group on health survey, improving quality and outcomes is uh, top concern in terms of uh, for employers in terms of health reforms. Um, and this ties into what Dr. Mary Camille just uh, guide us, uh, guided us through. And uh, one of the things that is important and that she stressed was uh, how does the solution um, uh, collect data on their programs and how do they um, share the data with, uh, with the client. So this is how we collect data. Everyone is assessed at baseline and then at regular intervals throughout the program with a series of measures. We measure pain, intent to pursue surgery because, I mean, surgeries make up for 50 to 60% of all MSK-related costs, whether people are taking medication. And then we also uh, measure um, anxiety, depression due to their uh, very close link with, with MSK conditions. We obviously look at productivity. A lot of the um, indirect costs of MSK conditions are related with uh, absenteeism and presenteeism. And we also look at self-efficacy and fear avoidance, and then uh, a body area specific patient reported outcome measure, which allows us to have a bit more granular data on visibility specific per body area. All of this data can and is shared periodically um, with, um, with our clients for the, uh, along with um, engagement and completion metrics. So we have full access to um, objective and transparent uh, data on how um, the population is faring and what type of clinical outcomes we are getting. Uh, we typically uh, present uh, percent improvements from baseline, but we can also provide um, absolute values, and that's what we uh, what goes into our data set. Um, and in uh, in terms of what we're seeing in the real world, uh, we are a uh, leader again in clinical outcomes. We're seeing up to 62% pain reductions in comparison to baseline, 60% reductions in the intent to pursue surgery, and almost 50% reduction in, in medication consumption. Um, now, these are very impressive numbers, uh, but let's present just a few more numbers on how does this translate into people's lives and how do we improve life at work and outside work. Uh, so when you ask members to compare how they are versus how they were in the beginning, 80% of our members report feeling better or a great deal better at the end of the program. Um, and uh, what we witnessed in terms of productivity is a 52% overall reduction in, in productivity losses. And that corresponds in absolute terms to about 14% of total work time given back uh, on average for um, for the people that suffer from MSK uh, conditions. Um, and uh, when we ask, how much does this, um, does your condition impact your life outside work on a zero to 10 scale? Um, and we ask people to graduate that, um, we, we see uh, about a 53% improvement. 
um, in the ability to carry out their daily activities outside work. So this is this speaks volumes to how happy they are and and how they can go on to live their lives free of pain and disability uh, caused by MSK conditions, both at work and and outside work. And actually, this is a, a, a perfect segue to the next topic, which is uh, what about the importance of a holistic approach and how can a given solution uh, impact adjacent areas and help address that uh, to try and avoid um, um, point solution fatigue? Um, well, it turns out that um, MSK um, health is the key um, to holistic care. Um, eight in 10 people with uh, chronic pain screen positive for mental health conditions. And uh, the other way around, uh, we also know that um, MSK conditions are a driver for depression and anxiety because they lead to pain and disability. Um, but if you take a deeper dive on, uh, on, on, on how MSK relates to other conditions, uh, you'll see that there's a two times increased risk for heart disease in people with back pain, 25% um, increased risk of cancer for people with back pain, and 16% increased risk for diabetes for people with osteoarthritis. And a lot of this has to do with modifiable risk factors. So a lot of this can be, come back to, can be overcome by providing people with an exercise education and cognitive behavioral therapy-based program, um, which is essentially what we do and the three pillars that we base our programs on. If you lead people to uh, live an active, a more active, healthier lifestyle, and you also help them manage their MSK condition, lowering pain and disability, and also if you help them gain the right tools to tackle some of the mental health issues and behavioral health issues that they're overcoming, then you just open the door to impact multiple areas outside direct MSK pain and disability. And um, this, um, again, is a circle that reinforces uh, what I just said and the importance of um, uh, good MSK health in, in, in for all these other areas. And the next set of slides uh, illustrate how effectively we impact other areas. So if you address uh, ment uh, musculoskeletal care, you can actually have a massive impact on mental health. If we look at members within our, that enroll in our program that also screen positive for anxiety or depression at baseline, we see that we can massively reduce anxiety and depression scores by 73% and 76% respectively. Actually, uh, if you compare the impact that we have on mental health scores for people who screen positive for mental health conditions or behavioral health conditions, and if we compare that with the outcomes that are publicly available for mental health companies, you will see that we are on par with mental health um, digital solutions. And this speaks volumes to how effective driving down pain and disability associated with MSK can be in impacting uh, mental health, but it also speaks to how our cognitive behavioral therapy program that is embedded within our digital MSK care programs, how impactful that program can be in also addressing behavioral health issues. Chances are if you're in pain uh, because of an MSK condition, you're not sleeping well, and we can also and do also have a massive impact on sleep. So um, if, if we pick up the members um, within uh, those that come to us that have sleep issues, and that's about that's more than 34% at baseline, more than 34% of people at baseline report significant sleep issues, 69% of them report at least partial recovery, and 54 report total recovery. Um, and that um, this alone speaks volumes to then how we can influence productivity, how we can influence general quality of life, and also how, can, how we can reduce the risk of re-injury, because lack of sleep is a risk factor for MSK injuries at work. Now, SORT is not a weight loss management solution. Uh, but part of what we do is getting people to exercise to tackle their MSK pain. 
And we want them to exercise and continuing exercising. And so part of what we do is also trying to drive them to live a more active and healthier lifestyle. And when we look at how impactful we are at changing habits, we will see that um, we see about a 33% increase in physical activity levels um, in our members. So we get, um, we get them to exercise more. And um, on average, members that go through our program lose about 2.3 pounds. And this impact is even more profound if you look at the um, um, obesity grade three uh, um, cohort, um, those that have BMI over 40 experience an even greater uh, weight loss. Again, this is by influencing how much people exercise and trying to get them to become more active. Um, and this was measured at three and six months after enrolling our program. So this is sustained um, uh, change in behaviors. Again, driven by the, the way we, we develop our programs and the relationship that is built together uh, with the physical therapist that is assigned to that member. Um, but obviously, um, I mean, everyone uh, is worried about um, um, improving health quality and clinical outcomes at a population level, but that cannot come at an increased cost. And in fact, um, there's a quote by Michael Porter, um, it should not be presumed that quality care uh, is more expensive. And in fact, when we look at um, how sort can influence healthcare utilization and expenditure in, in MSK, you will see that we can, at the end of the year, um, produce the highest savings um, in the digital MSK care space of around um, almost $2,500 on a yearly basis. And this is validated by a third party, by the Validation Institute, um, that has gone into our data and validated our assumptions and, um, and, and how we got to those numbers. Uh, but drilling uh, a bit deeper on this, uh, um, the majority of expenditure within MSK comes from uh, surgeries, which make up, make up for about 50 to 60% of all MSK-related expenditure. So naturally, reducing the number of people who progress to surgery brings is where we can bring the most savings. But we can also uh, um, in, influence other healthcare budget expenditures, namely um, reducing the number of people going through invasive procedures like injections, going through other forms of therapy, but also reducing costs with imaging, office visits, and others. And it all adds up to sustained and significant savings. And how we arrived to this number was we compared a group of people going through our programs and a control group um, matched by age, gender, um, body area, and um, uh, baseline MSK expenditure. And we compared uh, healthcare utilization and costs in the 12 months prior to enrolling in a program and 12 months post. And we did this with the two groups and this is uh, claims based and how we got uh, to these savings. So um, in summary, uh, we, can, uh, we can not only bring about uh, sustained and, and, and great clinical outcomes, but we can also save a lot of money by delivering cost effective interventions uh, within the MSK care space. And what you see in this slide still doesn't take into consideration how we can impact adjacent areas like mental health. And it also doesn't take into consideration um, indirect uh, costs like the costs with uh, productivity, absenteeism and presenteeism that we can also largely influence. Um, now, obviously um, all of this and all that we are saying and, and, and the reason and how a given solution shows uh, that they believe and that we believe in what we're doing, it comes down to how much we put at stake and, and um, SORT does have performance guarantees based on return on investment, uh, where we typically present a one to five, a 1.5 to one ROI, but we also have um, fees at risk based on pain reduction and um, member satisfaction. Um, I, I also want to address uh, that inherently um, digital health solutions 
need to become a solution for solving inequities in accessing healthcare. Uh, just because it's digital doesn't mean that it needs to be inaccessible, unusable by people from all sorts of um, racial, ethnical backgrounds, educational levels, uh, technological literacy, or uh, geographical uh, areas of residency, or all of those factors uh, that are uh, grouped uh, between um, in the designation of social determinism of health. And in fact, uh, when we look at what factors influence healthcare outcomes, as much as 80% of the factors that influence our health occur outside the walls of hospitals and clinics. And um, I want to draw the attention to two particular data points uh, that showcase how SORT can help address uh, health inequities. And so we know, and this has been thoroughly published in the literature, that non-whites, especially Black and Hispanics, have higher burden of MSK conditions, higher disability. They have less access and engage less with physical therapy. And when they do, they have worse outcomes. And now, if you look at our population, uh, our member base, people come to us in all shapes and sizes. Our member base um, has a similar um, uh, distribution in terms of racial and ethnic backgrounds as the US population. And we do see what the literature also sees, a higher burden of MSK and a higher baseline disability in uh, Blacks and Hispanics. But what we also see is that by the end of our programs, the clinical outcomes are similar across uh, the different um, racial and ethnic background groups, which also means, in other words, that Black and Hispanics actually improve a bit more than than, than other groups, and um, and so that by the end of our programs, the outcomes remain similar between the different groups. So um, we don't see worse outcomes going through uh, going through our programs. Um, and this is contrary to what the literature presents. Again, this showcases how SORT can level the playing field and make sure that all uh, racial and ethical backgrounds get access to high quality care and can benefit equally, if not more, um, uh, than, what they, um, than what they would in, in the real world. Um, this, um, data, th this, this chart depicts uh, the distribution of our members by county at a U.S. level, um, and um, the color, the heat map uh, that you see there corresponds to the social deprivation index. So there's an index that measures social deprivation on a county by county level, and we see that about 11% of all our members live in highly socially deprived areas. Um, and uh, we also see, um, if we look at the clinical outcomes of our program, that uh, members who reside in more socially deprived areas uh, benefit equally from the program. Again, this shows how SORT can level the playing field and make sure that digital health is not something that increases inequalities in accessing care, but also, but actually something that decreases inequalities and that drives access to high quality care, even for people who reside in socially deprived areas and that would naturally have lower engagement, lower access and lower outcomes when uh, when engaging with, with healthcare resources. Um, and this uh, concludes my section of the presentation. We will now open this to Q&A and we are really welcome to answer any and all questions that you may have. The first one is, how would virtual compare to in-person therapy? Well, um, I can get that one. Um, I've shown um, a few charts on the um, on what we on the outcomes of of our randomized control trials, where we compared our digital programs against high-intensity in-person PT, um, and again, these showed that we were able to maximize clinical outcomes on the short, mid, and long term by packing a lot more intensity early on and by empowering people. But I don't want to um, focus just on that. Let me just answer a bit more broadly. Uh, I think that um, 
this is not a war between digital and in-person care. And uh, we do know that digital solutions are in nature uh, more scalable than human solutions and than human-led solutions because technology helps scale humans. And so we need to ensure that we have high quality of care, at least as good as, as if someone would go to an in-person PT, because then we can provide scalability. Now, the missing link here is in the future, and it was like the pendulum swayed for all in-person to then all digital during the pandemic, and, th and now, and now we need to, um, and now we need to reconcile both worlds. And how do we reconcile both worlds? Well, there are clinical clinical uh, cases where in person is better. Um, there are, let's say, complex clinical cases. Someone who has cardiac insufficiency, COPD, plus multiple joints affected at the same time, they probably need. Um, in-person PT, but the great majority of cases can actually be served with digital. And then there are people who can start digital and finish in-person, like return to sports, and people like complex shoulder surgeries or um, that can start in-person and then complete their program digitally. Finally, there are always going to be people who prefer in-person and always going to be people who don't have time to drive back and forward and go to a clinic. So there's an element of personal preference here. So the short answer is digital is an established avenue of care, at least as effective as in person. There's a matter of clinical judgment to decide which is best for that specific person. And there's a matter of personal judgment, but I would say digital can be a solution for 80, 90% of all cases. Great, thank you. And our next question is, does SWORD work with other providers? In other words, can a physical therapist at SWORD work with a primary care doctor to help coordinate treatment? Uh, definitely. Um, well, first of all, that's uh, part of what PTs do on a regular basis. They're used to interfacing with their clinical counterparts, exchanging notes, and, and defining treatment programs. Um, we can and do reach out, and in fact, through our gateway, which is called SORT360, we can push information to uh, the more than 90% of, 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 of EMRs and get information from, so we can share notes with, uh, with the practitioner of the record for that person. Great, thank you. And our next question. What are the biggest hurdles that prevent people from using more virtual physical therapy in lieu of surgery? I can answer that, but I will, would also love to hear Mary Kay's thoughts. <laughs> well, I think I, I'm back on my theme that um, uh, Fernando and company can put together the most perfect uh, scientifically based program and you still have to get the um, information about the program in front of the person who needs it when they need it. So that's a kind of a marketing engagement uh, effort, which you know sometimes marketing people think that you're just promoting things, but actually getting somebody to understand what their options are and how it would work for them and to trust and you know get them over the hurdle of getting started, I think is one of the biggest things. And so that's why I was, pushing um, on issues such as uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion to think about placing things in front of different groups of people and making sure that that's um, working, as well as connecting the services such as SWORD to whatever else an individual is encountering in terms of their benefits or work site to have it connected. So, um, so if, a, if an issue comes up where SWORD is the, is the best resource that they have, available to them that they can get there quickly and, and get started. Great, thank you. And our next question, sure. uh, can you talk more about how SWORD addresses other? Yeah, um, I've, I've touched briefly um, on that, but um, um, so um, our programs revolve around three things, exercise, education, and changing behaviors. Um, and when you think about what education we need to do and what changing behaviors means, um, 
the, the cool thing about the musculoskeletal system is that um, you need to exercise, you need to exercise your muscles, you need to exercise your tendons, and that is actually what can get you long-standing results. So um, we design our programs to help people get better, but we design our behavioral change component to help people stay better. Then part of that is, is the empowerment piece. Another part is how we obviously deliver educational components um, in an engaging way and not bothering way so that we gently nudge people to understand along the course of the program that they need to, to keep active and we need to give them small cues and advice on how quickly on a daily basis they can move a bit more, do a bit of an exercise, a bit of a stretch to just make sure that the muscles and tendons are working properly and that they don't relapse. Um, finally, um, the um, our physical therapists work together with the people and that's the reason why we train them in motivational interviewing to guide people through the, 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 the changes, the change stages, and make sure that we are effective in our communication. And some of the goals, I mean, maybe, I mean, this is where personalized programs enter into effect. I mean, your goals and my goals can be completely different, but if my goal is, I mean, running five miles and um, another person's goal can be um, picking up their grandchildren, but how do we, stimulate people to introduce small changes um, in their life instead of asking them for like a 30-minute exercise session seven days a week or five days a week, how do we introduce two, three, five minutes on a daily basis? So we work with people along, uh, uh, along those lines. And that um, ends up by um, getting a lot of people to exercise more and this has impact on uh, weight. This has impact on general well-being because exercise obviously puts endorphins and in, uh, um, uh, circulating through a system. Uh, then by assessing pain and disability, we can, we can also massively improve sleep. And obviously, if you're in less pain and less disabled, chances are your mental health will also improve. But we realize that a lot of people are dealing with anxiety and depression. And just because we reduce pain and, and, and disability doesn't necessarily mean that they improve their mental health. So we take advantage of the fact that cognitive behavioral therapy has been proven to be effective in both anxiety and depression on the one side and chronic pain on the other side. So we use, we develop a fully fledged cognitive behavioral program that teaches people how to deal with the pain that they have but also how to deal with the anxiety and depression that they may be feeling. Is this a substitute for proper medical treatment when they have severe depression or severe anxiety? No. Uh, can we help a ton of people? Yes, we can. And, and that's how we think about these things. Yeah, I think it's been frustrating that people are educated about heart health and all kinds of things, but actually musculoskeletal health is something that people don't understand. And because they experience pain, they have what Fernando referred to earlier as fear avoidance behavior. They don't know how to start. They don't know what's safe. They don't know if they've got a heart condition and musculoskeletal pain, how to get going. So I think, you know, getting those resources and walking people through experientially that they can do this, that they can gradually improve, that they feel better, they sleep better, I think that's super important in making the difference over time. Great, thank you. And our last question is, how many clinical studies have you published in total? Could you share the link to the trials mentioned in your pre presentation? Yeah, uh, we can, they're all public. Uh, I, this kind of sounds strange, but I believe it's 17. <laughs> um, we recently published one this week, so uh, I think the updated count is 17 total. And yeah, we can share the link. All right, great, thank you.